in the U.S., two of our biggest industries are the food industry and the uh, uh, medical um, industry, um, uh, called the sick care industry, um, and and they're both multi-trillion-dollar industries. And we've ended up with a a food industry that makes people sick, and then a sick care industry who takes care of them. Hello and welcome back to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director. Today we are digging into the underbelly of the typical American diet and the pervasive allure of ultra-processed foods, which now make up an astounding 60% of the American diet. This group covers packaged cereals, breads, yogurts, frozen dinners, plus of course sweets and soda. And there's mounting scientific evidence that the UPFs are not only potentially addictive, but are also linked to our rocketing rates of obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. We all know that food can be medicinal or potentially toxic. So how do we recognize these junk foods and make better eating choices? There are strong links between diet and disease, and we now understand that the alchemy of certain food combinations make up HPFs, hyperpalatable foods, which are designed to be irresistible to your taste buds. So to help us make sense of some of these eating enigmas, we've gifted ourselves with the presence of three knowledgeable guests today. We have Jerry Mand, who is CEO of Nourish Science and an adjunct professor of nutrition at Harvard's Chan School of Public Health. He has a wealth of experience in national public health and food policy, having served in the White House in senior policymaking positions for three presidents in the USDA, the FDA, and OSHA. He helped lead landmark public health initiatives, and in 1992, under Bush, Mandel led the graphic design of the iconic nutrition facts label at FDA, for which he received the Presidential Design Award. We have Tara Fazzino. She's Associate Director of the Coffrin Logan Center for Addiction Research and Treatment at the University of Kansas. She's an experimental psychologist who studies processes involved in addiction, obesity, and eating disorders. And Larissa Zimbaroff is an investigative journalist who covers how the foods we eat are being changed by technology. She's author of the book, Technically Food Inside Silicon Valley's Mission to Change What We Eat. So welcome to you all. Thanks for making the time to share your knowledge with us today. So first, let's start with what we know about the American diet our increased disease rates and our declining life expectancy. Jerry, how do we stack up against the rest of the developed world and why are we doing so badly? Well, thank you, Mary, and I'm delighted to uh, join you uh, today. Um, we don't stack up uh, well. One common metric, really, if you're a nation, one of the maybe the most fundamental is your life expectancy. How long do you live? And for many, many years, the U.S. was with the take of the top 20 developed countries, we were sort of in the middle of the pack. And that started to change in the 1980s. Uh, we started to drop lower and lower among those 20. Um, and then pre-COVID, actually for the first time, um, many people expect life expectancies to increase from generation to generation, but for three years in a row, it had decreased. That was pre-COVID. Uh, then of course there was COVID, but even since COVID, where other nations have uh, recovered in some of their life expectancy, we've continued to uh, drop, um, gaining a little. Um, but when you look at those 20 developed countries now, the U.S. is uh, far and away the worst off. And so we're very uh, sick. We're very sick. Okay. And well, uh, I think we've got some charts here, Jerry, that you've sent us uh, showing our changing obesity rates, which are pretty appalling now over the last 30 years. So perhaps we could pull up those graphics. 
These are produced by our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and, and it's based on studies they do, and it's a map of obesity rates uh, across uh, the nation. And as you can see here, uh, this is uh, maps they started producing in the 1980s, and by 1990, they had data on almost every state. And as you can see here, there isn't a single state in the country that has a 15% obesity rate. So there was some obesity, some obesity is caused by uh, uh, metabolic conditions, illnesses not related to our food. And I think what you see here in the 1990 map is a, a nation that is largely a uh, well uh, regarding its food. And then you fast forward to today, the map on the right, it's from the latest study data from 2022, and it's just dramatic. And the, again, on the one on the left, not a single state reaches 15%. Here now, 30 years later, there isn't a single state at, at 15%. In fact, there isn't a single state with less than a, a 25%. And as you can see here, that's just a few. Most states are over 30 and almost half are over 35% obese. And the problem with that is how sick it makes us. All the diseases, obesity itself is a disease, but the heart disease, the cancer, the diabetes uh, that come with it. And even during COVID, um, um, we now know that two thirds of severe COVID cases, hospitalizations were uh, due to these underlying dietary conditions and indeed maybe as many as 800,000 deaths. So we know we're doing badly. Uh, we don't seem to be changing our ways um, and it's not all our fault. So let's try and understand the groups of foods that are the chief culprits here. So these ultra processed foods, we're looking at a chart which um, was devised by Carlos Montero at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And he decided to look at foods differently, not necessarily because of the fats and the way that we looked at, at, at foods traditionally was to analyze them by the food types. So he started to look at what we did to food. So the first group there is the unprocessed foods. They're the things we know that pretty much are unadulterated fruits, vegetables, poultry, eggs. The second group are things that we probably would add to food. We don't eat them per se, but they're sugar, salt, honey. We flavor our food, preserve our food with them. So then we come to the third group, which is the processed food, which is largely made up of adding group one and group two together, canned beans, cured meats, fresh breads, cheeses, and preserves. And then we come to this awful group, the <laughs> ultra processed group. And this is where we're getting 60% of our foods now. So packaged snacks, frozen dinners, pastries, baked goods, soft drinks. So first of all, and this I'm going to open up to Jerry and then to everybody, why do Americans eat so much junk food? It can't just all be about comfort, this great word we keep hearing about comfort foods. So well, no, it's not. Happen. You're right. It's it's because of uh, three things: taste, cost, and convenience. And and so food companies that design uh, these processed foods are trying to meet what the public says um, it wants for the taste of uh, delicious food, uh, a cost as, as cheap or affordable as possible, and convenient. It doesn't take much time to cook or prepare. But the key thing is that the law already requires that food keep us uh, healthier, that it's safe. It doesn't make us sick, certainly. And, and that's the problem here is that companies are producing food um, that for taste, cost, and convenience, and they're ignoring the part of the law that says that people need to be able to eat these foods every day and not get sick. And it's also the government's fault, particularly the Food and Drug Administration, also the Department of Agriculture that enforces the laws. They're letting companies do this. They know these foods are making us sick. It's, it's so sick we saw earlier, and yet they're not acting on it. And so I think companies start off meeting at wanting to meet a consumer demand on taste, cost, cost and convenience, but they can't get there by creating foods that make us sick. And in this case, in a country with such high obesity rates, designing a food to be overeaten, which is what they're doing, they're creating, uh, using the um, uh, chemistry, the science that Tara will be able to tell you about better than I can, uh, but they're using it to manipulate those parts of our brains that result in us craving certain foods that will keep eating them even when it um, makes us sick. Okay, Tara, over to you. What yeah, do you so, think? Is... Go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, by the way. Um, so I think there's there's several aspects to this, but we know that a, a really critical piece of 
um, eating behavior and dietary habits um, comes from our food environment. Like what is around us, what is available to us and at what cost as Jerry was mentioning. And um, we know from a lot of, from some epidemiological work now that actually assessed um, the food system and not just people's eating behavior, we know that um, mm -hmm. our food system is largely comprised of ultra processed foods that are, you know, hyper palatable, difficult to stop eating. Um, and so when we are surrounded by these types of foods in the grocery store, in the convenience store, everywhere we go, um, that is a major factor in, you know, people's behavior. Um, we eat what is available to us, what is, um, um, you know, often least expensive. Um, and that is um, largely this food supply. Um, so I think the availability in the environment largely mirrors what people consume. Um, so I, I, I think that contextualizes it quite a bit. Um, and then, of course, the food's um, you know, as, as Jerry was, was um, alluding to already, um, the types of foods that are available um, that do have a lot of combined palatability nutrients that can um, provide a really kind of exaggerated uh, rewarding experience when we consume them that are different from kind of naturally occurring foods. Um, yeah, they can have some real consequences for um, our eating behavior in terms of, you know, over time, we can become sensitive, highly sensitive to cues in our environment. So advertisements, um, sales of these products in various convenience stores are kind of everywhere we look. And um, we can seek out and consume these foods um, and become hypersensitive to them um, in the environment um, to try to seek out and consume them over these um, healthy or minimally processed um, not hyper palatable, like fresh whole foods. Okay. So I think it's kind jump. of a dog, I mean. <laughs> Thank you. Can we jump over to, to Larissa here? So you've spent an awful lot of time researching the food and the technology industry. And even you are surprised uh, by things like cauliflower pizza crust, which you mentioned, which everyone thinks, oh, that's healthy. Mm, maybe not. Yeah. Um, well, you know, back to the question of why Americans eat so much junk food quickly. I think it's two things. Uh, we're too busy. We're working several jobs. We're working all the time. We've got our phone that has us plugged in all the time and our habits have changed. We no longer, it's no longer normal to go and buy five whole ingredients and cook dinner we now just reach for the crinkly packaged foods because they're tasty and convenient and cheap. And like Tara said, they're everywhere. You can't avoid them. So we actually haven't made our food system easy to navigate for anybody that, that most people don't know what, what we know collectively here as a group. Um, so that's those are the problems. We're too busy. Our habits have changed. And this uh, cheap, convenient, tasty food is just everywhere. It's, you know, proliferating around the country and then around the world um, about foods that we think are healthy, like cauliflower pizza. You know, we put that ingredient first as the hero. But then you look at the ingredients and there are starches, tapioca starch, rice starch. Um, I was just eating almonds today. I'm so sorry, Blue Diamond. But there's uh, um, corn maltodextrin, which is a sugar type of preservative, and there's hydrolyzed corn and soy protein. Now, I know it needs flavor, right? I want it that, to have that smoky flavor, but I don't know why it has to have these proteins. So um, my research is look at the ingredients and then go from there. Very important. I think that's the starting point. If people can just read the, the label and there's a whole bunch of stuff uh, it probably isn't the best. And, and actually, Jerry had a great example of this where he says, you know, there's so much processing done. If you buy bread, you know, that's been molded or extruded or processed, uh, he said it probably, if it's in a pa plastic bag, is like a very sophisticated emulsified foam. <laughs> and when you hear that, if that was on the actual package, you probably wouldn't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... To that point, I know that, you know, you brought Jerry in, but but steps of processing, you know, how many people touched the ingredients 
how many steps of processing has led something to your plate? As someone with diabetes, I think about carbohydrates and 15 grams from a piece of fruit in, of carbs is not the same as 15 grams of carbs from puffed popcorn or you know chips. That's interesting. So you actually had to learn this firsthand being diabetic from quite a young age. So yeah. if, you, if you were wanting something right now from the government or the food industry, hard, maybe more than one thing, but if you could just ask for one big thing as a, as a consumer today, what would you be asking for? I, my, my idea is that there are guardrails. So Kraft Heinz or Nestle or General Mills, they're allowed to have, I don't know, 10% of their, of their assortment of products can fall into UPF and everything else has to be out of that. Uh, that's, you know, my current idea, you know, I'm not a regulator. I'm not in government. I don't have Jerry's background at the FDA and I don't have Tara's, you know, PhD, but I think that we need to make it easier for consumers to buy food. That's good for them. And right now we're not there. We're very far from that. So when we do all this stuff to food, we break it down, we build it back up. We enhance it with flavors. We preserve it. We put additives in it. Do, what do we do to the integrity of food? And is it harmful to us? Well, let me give you one example. You know, humans, homo sapiens have 150,000 years of evolution that we've been uh, through that, been designed to um, survive on a certain food environment. And part of that is something called the microbiome. Many of your listeners may have heard of that. It may be hard to know what that is, but that's really the bacterial cells that are predominantly in our uh, digestive tract, but are common in our bodies um, that we knew were there. Uh, for a long time, we, we knew they were there. There are actually more uh, bacterial cells in your body than uh, human cells, uh, but we thought they were just sort of going along for the ride and provided certain functions. Well, now we know that those cells communicate with the human cells and, and, and tell us certain things. So let me give you one example. Um, when bakers bake bread, a fermentation product as, as it once was uh, first created and gave that to people, they didn't really destroy the cell wall of the ingredients, the wheat and other things. There was some milling that took place. Um, but when you ate that, the more refined part of the carbohydrate uh, went into your intestine and was absorbed as, as energy for your body. But the cell wall part of it uh, that would continued down your digestive tract, reached the microbiome, and that's what fed it. That's where it got its calories. Now today, those emulsified foams I was talking about that are in these cellophane bags, um, they've destroyed all of the cell wall. And the government's not doing its job. It said that, well, you know, as long as you have the same proportion of bran and the sperm and um, fiber, you can call it 100% whole grain bread. Well, that's just not true. When you manipulate the uh, particle size of what's in that bread, uh, what ends up happening is when you eat it, um, it, there's nothing left to go down to the microbiome. It's all absorbed earlier in the digestive tract and no energy gets down to the microbiome because all of that cell wall material that was once in products we ate have been pulverized by the kinds of extreme processing ultra-processed foods go through. The result is that is we think now and the science is still evolving is that the microbiome sends a signal getting where you're not we're not getting any calories down here human host send some more down here and so it's triggering your hormones to get you to eat more because as far as it's concerned you're not getting these calories because it doesn't know that it's being absorbed all upwards so you know 150,000 years our body was designed to encounter foods as they occurred um, um you know alongside people in, in nature and we just haven't caught up to the radical transformation that companies are making to our food. And most importantly, the government hasn't insisted that when they make these transformations, they demonstrate they're safe for people to eat. They're not. It's a very important point that you raise. Um, we all know how many people are now suffering from allergies. I mean, they're through the roof. People never used to be allergic. Um, certainly when I was growing up, I think there was one person I remember in the whole time growing up that was allergic to milk. Um, nobody had peanut allergies or anything else. Um, I have plenty of friends, I'm sure you do, who when they're in Europe can eat bread, but they can't eat bread when they come to America. They get really ill. 
And they will say, oh, I'm gluten intolerant, I'm gluten intolerant. But then they go back to Italy or somewhere and they, they can eat bread, which strikes me that something is happening, as you say, to the integrity of that food stuff that is harmful beyond our even our understanding. And I'm sure Tara might be able to talk about some of the other issues that food's causing, like apart from allergies, asthma and, uh, and, and even depression amongst people. Do you want to sure. Share? I think that there, I mean, there are many potential effects of these foods that, you know, as you mentioned, we're starting to be able to understand now, but we have quite a bit of work and kind of a lot of catch up to do really um, in terms of the foods themselves, because they are often designed in a manner that can keep us eating, which ultimately results for companies in like us purchasing and more of their food. Um, but that by that same design, um, you know, we're often in a, in a state where we are consuming foods that are difficult within the eating occasion to stop eating. That can, um, you know, we've, we've clearly talked about metabolic disease and obesity, things like that. Um, our, the hypothesis is that these foods may also lead to among a vulnerable subset of individuals, um, addictive like eating behavior, um, binge eating as well. Um, and, you know, because these foods, you know, if we eat a lot of them, um, sometimes it makes people feel bad um, and they sort of attribute that to themselves. But, you know, I think a broader point is that, no, they're designed to do that. Like that's in the design. That's the intent. Um, so I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of reach into like, what is this doing to other types of, you know, eating behaviors, eating disorders, um, you know, related to mood and anxiety and depression. There's actually also some, um, maybe, um, Laura, Jerry could speak more to the mechanism here, but there's been some evidence that has come out to suggest that something um, in the processing of the foods may be um, interacting with the gut microbiome in a way that increases um, levels of depression and, um, you know, issues with mood regulation. And so um, the effects are, are quite um, um, uh, pronounced and quite um, wide spanning. Yeah. Does anyone want to hop in on that? Well, I think that, you know, and this is like armchair thoughts, which is that if, if like, you know, Kevin Hall were to do a study into uh, 20 depressed people and fed them ultra processed food diet and a, then a whole foods diet, and then we see what changes, you know, and that's unfortunately big food isn't doing anything until, you know, we have studies that make them that really kind of hold their feet to the fire and make them make change. They started to reformulate with COVID at through COVID, they started to reformulate to make foods, you know, healthier because people were starting to think more about that. Now that we're, you know, mostly out of COVID, I don't know that their um, attention is still there. They may have moved on, right? And now I know they're focused on the ozempic type drugs, the semaglutides, mm -hmm. right? And the concern and the fear that people are going to buy less of the junk food because they're no longer interested, right? And all the headlines are speaking to that right now. So, you know, they're they're smarter and they have more dollars to spend and they're going to stay ahead of us. And so really it's like, how do we get ahead of big food? And without the government on our side, you know, I'm not sure how we get ahead of them. Well, I'll add to that, you know, I mean, big food companies, unfortunately, have um, undue influence over the government because of their large investments and who gets elected to Congress, who gets appointed to the court system. And they're the, those, you know, they're not interested in uh, abortion or other issues. They're really trying to make sure they have no or minimal regulation. And, and the result of that is they're able to... Um, pursued products without the kind of proper oversight. And I'll give you one example of what's really driving this, I think, with companies is that 
company, big food companies have tied their increasing in profits, the growth that um, Wall Street demands of them to really just selling more calories. And so the way that they make more money and grow as a company and are deemed successful is they need to sell more calories. And we're stuck with that. Uh, but they don't stop there. They also use their influence then to affect other government policies. And probably might be the one of the most important is that preventing investment in nutrition research by our National Institutes of health. Uh, they lobby the Congress to make sure that that's not funded. And as a result, uh, less than 5% of the NIH budget helps us answer some of these questions we're talking about. Um, it, it, think about it. it it's, it's, it is remarkable. We have institutes of uh, diabetes, uh, heart disease, cancer. What are all the, those are large multi-billion dollar um, institutes that consume almost all of NIH's money um, trying to find treatments for those diseases. But what do they all have in common? They're mostly caused by our food, yet we're not doing any investment in the research to help us uh, solve that. That Then companies could benefit that. If we knew the answers of, of why the food is causing these impacts, um, then the government could help set regulations or say, well, you need to change how you design it. We now know this. We now have a microbiome test. You know, someday we'll have that test where that we can force companies when they're designing a food to put it into a model and it, it you know it mimics the microbiome and it says well look the result you can't make a food that does that to the microbiome we just don't have those tests yet and the reason we don't have those tests are companies have kept uh, the government for investing in the nutrition science to provide them well yes you've said it very well the the fox is uh, minding the chickens sadly in terms of uh, looking out for the public interest um, so what we do know, you alluded to a study, um, Larissa, and um, I think you're all familiar with this uh, 2019 NIH study where they had two groups of people. One consumed a diet high in UPFs and the other had an unprocessed diet and they each could eat as much as they wanted for two weeks. And then immediately following, they swapped the diet. The group that ate the UPFs ate 500 calories more a day and gained fat and weight, while the unprocessed food group lost weight. This happened in 30 days. So this is a dramatic study. And instead of people hopping on and saying, God, we need to know more about this, there hasn't been a similar study. Isn't that correct, Kevin? Uh, Jerry? It was Kevin's study. Yes, uh, Kevin Hall, who Larissa mentioned before, was the author of that study. And first, it was hard for him to do. You know, he was from the camp of nutritionists. I'm from that same uh, brotherhood or sisterhood where we thought it was the nutrients. That's what we learned decades ago when we were dealing with a global starvation. If we thought of food, not as food, but if we thought of it as calories, protein, uh, vitamins, minerals, that became the framework uh, that helped us uh, prevent uh, uh, malnutrition and, and, and health harms related to that. And we've really solved that problem, particularly in the US. But what's replaced it is these chronic diseases. And increasingly, when we try to apply that paradigm of nutrients to what's causing the chronic diseases it hasn't par you know came out that way now kevin is was of that belief and so he actually did his study to prove that right he matched them for nutrients something you, you didn't mention so the diets the minimally processed the ultra processed were identical in terms of these nutrients same amount of sugar fat salt caloric density and he thought the result would be then once you do that this this characterizing food about the level of processing would, would, wouldn't matter it, because we know it's not that ultra processed food is ultra processed. It's that it has more salt, sugar, and fat. Well, when he corrected for that, he expected to find no difference. Instead, he found that, as you described, a 500 calorie a day difference. Now, here's another problem with that. First of all, it took him a long time to do that study because NIH has only given him enough facility to enroll a few people at a time. So you say 20, that's not very many, but he couldn't even bring them all in at once and do his study. He had to bring in a couple of a time, do it a couple of a time. That's just because of how poorly they're investing this study. And in any other area of biomedical research, if you got a result like this, so astonishing, they would repeat that study right away, certainly within the year, um, with more people over more time so he could answer the question. Yet they've done nothing to do that. In fact, they threatened to shut down his uh, lab, not because of his work, just because they heard more from members of Congress wanting to do more research on Alzheimer's disease or other things than they hear about food. So they just were trying to meet that need. But, but you know, it, we're not getting the answers that we need to help 
to protect the public so that America can have a higher um, life expectancy, not uh, lower life expectancy. And we need to change that. And that study needs to be repeated as soon as possible. Um, and I can add to that as well, because um, so shortly after Kevin published this study, um, he and I collaborated together to analyze this study and another um, inpatient feeding trial that he had conducted to look at, like, what might be some of the mechanisms, given that we know that these diets that he used in the various conditions were matched for, you know, overall uh, caloric content, overall fat, you know, carbohydrates, that type of thing. And so what we found was that um, in the secondary analysis that the two um, kind of most potent factors in the degree to which people within their meal consumed more calories was the extent to which the meal was comprised of foods that had higher energy density. So calories per bite, that was one. And then another feature was the degree to which the foods, uh, the meal was hyper palatable. So had combinations of nutrients at specific thresholds um, that can or induce additives. Like highly, sorry. Or additives, not just nutrients. Yeah, so we looked at nutrients, but there were likely other things as well that we couldn't characterize. But so as far as I'm aware right now, Kevin is repeating this trial and also categorizing based on hyperpalatability and energy density to see, you know, if he can get a bit more at these mechanisms. But, um, you know, we can stay tuned. <laughs> and I'm not aware, aware of any other type of work that's going on in that space, but is desperately needed. But look, you know, we had COVID. Uh, we needed an answer quickly. We did the research. We had a vaccine um, in record-breaking time in less than a, a you know a year to to help people. Here, um, you know, 14, 15, 1600 Americans die every day, a comparable almost to COVID, and at its high point, um, every day because of the food. And yet, we haven't repeated this uh, study yet to come up with answers. And why is that? It's because the food industry exerts its pressure on the budgets of the government agencies who could help here, uh, because they're putting profits ahead of uh, people. And, and one thing I'll point out in particular is just how sick our children are, uh, something that's often lost. I had to privilege when I was at FDA to work on tobacco regulation. Um, that was the leading cause of death uh, then. It was uh, uh, 25, 30% of high school students smoke. Today, it's less than two. We, we succeeded in, in regulating uh, that. Uh, but children became addicted, but they weren't yet sick. Those diseases from smoking came later. What, what I think is extraordinary here is that the food is not only making adults sick, but we have children with uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, many of your listeners may recall when it was called adult onset because it just didn't occur in kids. But we had to change the name because it's become so common. Fatty liver disease, a disease that's, again, associated with older people, alcoholics, now is in children. In fact, in the last decade, the most rapid-growing uh, area of, of fatty liver diseases in our children. And, and then bariatric surgery, one of the few successful treatments till these GLP-1s, we had a very extreme uh, procedure that affects you for a life, uh, takes out a, a large part of your stomach. We were doing that on teenagers. And then now these new GLP-1 drugs, which we, as far as we know, you need to stay on for life. We're trying to figure out how to give them to our children to, to help them. And so, you know, it's, it's just extraordinary. I mean, again, uh, shorter lifespans, that's awful. We need to do that. But just even thinking about any parent, anyone with children, to know that one of the greatest risks your child faces is getting sick by just feeding them the food that's being sold in the stores. It's a very good point. And so why have we not got health regulations? I mean, you've got restrictions on, you know, tobacco products now carry health, you know, this may endanger your health. Why have we not got this food may endanger your health or a limit. Don't have more than four Oreos a day. I mean, I think, okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like so mad about this because again, we're putting the consumer in, they're responsible for stopping. They're responsible for buying the right things. And what they're not doing it now, they're not buying the right things and they're not stopping. How is a warning on the front of the package going to change their minds or change what's happening? I was in Mexico and I was buying, um, you know, spicy nuts. Clearly, you can tell I like nuts. Um, and there were warnings on the package that said it was high in sodium and fat, but I didn't even notice the warning until the next day when I saw it. So to me, that's, again, putting the consumer as re the responsible party in a sea of junk food. And, you know, it's the sea of junk food that has to change. 
Yeah, Larissa is absolutely right. You know, I think that there's a role for consumers to play, and certainly people have a responsibility. But for, as she was describing so articulately earlier, about how people have um, are required to often work more than one job, uh, work long hours, um, and 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 the convenience and cost of food is extremely important to most Americans in terms of what they eat, and they're not being provided those options. You know, you can tell someone, well, you should scratch cook and go to your local farmer market. I mean, that is a very privileged way to be able to eat, and and it's great for people who can do that. We should encourage it, but we need to recognize uh, for most people, um, just trying to even. When they get, you know, I'll tell this one anecdote. Um, you, you know, you listen to people. I meet with people who've been diagnosed with a, a chronic disease. Uh, their doctors told them that they're going to um, die much earlier if they don't uh, try to change that. And so the first thing they encounter is they have to go to the store and try to find these foods that are lower in sodium, uh, that don't have some of these ingredients that could make them sick. And it's hard to do. And they find that they really can't get the prepared frozen meals. There, there's some out there at the at the Whole Foods store or something that you can't afford. But in, the, in their local grocery stores, the kinds of ready to eat and eat meals um, are, aren't good for you. They'll make them sick, according to their doctor. So they stop buying those foods. They try to eat better. Here's the most heart-wondering thing to me. When you talk to them and say, they go, well, that's not even the hardest part. They go, the hardest part is that I try to eat healthier and my friends get mad at me. Oh, uh. And, 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 and they, what are you doing? And because it challenges everyone's sense of their, of, of normalcy and how the world should work. And it's because the companies and their marketing and everything, you know, people should expect that food, they, whatever that's being sold in the store, they can eat that and not get sick. That is the, absolutely the right way for consumers to behave and to believe. And, and they shouldn't have to look out for themselves and say, well, well no, we're going to just flood the market with foods advertising all around that if you just ate those all the time, you're going to end up with diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. And in fact, not just you as the grownups, the children will have these diseases. Your child may get an amputation. That's happened uh, frequently oh. because of diabetes in children. That that just shouldn't happen. And companies should not be allowed to get away with that. And we're letting them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, it, and I think it, um, like, it also plays directly into the industry's playbook about individual responsibility. This isn't a food issue. This is an individual person's problem so like we're not creating the food that we're creating is not the problem when in fact it absolutely is um and it's saturated the market um you know to put it back on you know primarily on the individual um plays right in it's the similar you know that it's the industry playbook from you know the tobacco epidemic same thing for years and years and years you know, oh, smoking is an individual responsibility, you know, so this, this has been used before. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a, a, there's a salience to, you know, some, to being able to say, oh, well, you know, you can just, you know, the, the, um, for example, the labels on the vending machines, like choose responsibly, like, you know, from the companies and like, oh, watch your calorie. But it all plays in and it diverts the attention and it diverts the real, the the ability to identify and directly actually address the key driver, which is the foods in the food environment. You're when, absolutely right. When, sorry, one quick thing, which is that I was at a food conference and someone from a big soda company, you know, one of the two said, we're just creating products that consumers want. We're giving them what they want, where they are. So it's that rise in snacking. It's that rise in different beverages. And they're saying that we are determining what we want, but we are not, right? We are where we are because of what they have done over the last many, many decades. It's a good. It's a very good point. I I uh, wrote to JetBlue after the last flight I was on. You know what could we do better? I said, why do you throw pretzels, goldfish, sweet cookies, and nachos around the cabin like we're all a bunch of uh, you know chimps in 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 uh, cages? And they just throw them out. Why not have one decent health? Give someone an apple or a banana. Or, or even a bag of nuts if they're not allergic. I said, why is it that this is all we can hope for? And it's unlimited. Eat as much as you like. Um, I, th I just think it's pervasive. The whole, that whole mentality. Well, you're right. And I think, the, 
I think a key thing, though, is that, and I agree with you, I actually flew on jet flew a lot. I used to commute from D.C. to, to Boston every week. And, and that was the same thing I put on every questionnaire I filled out from them is what you <laughs> said. But here's the thing. Yes, they should be able to make those fruits and vegetables possibly available as well. They're harder to, to maintain. But here's the thing. There's no reason that the processed food, they could it shouldn't make you sick. It is already the law. Um, companies have to go back and redesign it and say that, you know, taste, cost, and convenience are three of the four requirements when you design a food. And the fourth is that people should be able to eat it every day if that's what the food is designed for um, and not get sick. And and they need to put in, invest the money and the research and the development to come up with products that do that. And when they see that it's, you know, if they sell this product and a kid eats it every day, they're going to end up with type 2 diabetes diabetes, I, I can't sell that. I have to dial that back. And as you know, mentioned, yeah, maybe you can uh, sell some of those that can be part of your product line. It can't become your whole product line. And it's not, you know, consumers to say that the consumers are asking for these things. The consumers are not asking for their children to be sick. They're not asking for them to be the sick. And that's what they're giving them. They're, they're, they're hiding behind the fact, well, they're asking for these other things. They're not necessarily connected. Uh, you can provide taste, cost, and convenience and foods that don't make people sick if someone forces you to do that. And we're not doing right. that today. That's exactly it. No, there's no compulsion. Um, a food journalist at New York Times she said, food companies use science, marketing, and political influence to get customers hooked on their products, which I thought was a perfect explanation of the whole thing. So what chance do the poor and disadvantaged have to resist this when they make bad food so cheap and so available? What chance do they have? I mean, I mean, the, the data says that the higher intake rates have been observed in low income populations of these ultra processed foods and um, SNAP benefits, if they have them, lead to greater, um, a mm. greater percentage of their diet being uh, UPF. We are asking low income people who have more than two jobs, right, and no time and no money to buy whole foods and to cook. And, you know, Dollar General Store just announced that it had produce in 5,000 stores, but that's just less than a third of their whole uh, 19,000 stores that they have in the U.S. So they were cheering it on, right? But it's still not enough. And I don't have the data on what people were buying and how much it was in their cart. But the lower and disadvantaged people are are the more most susceptible, even though UPF is in everybody's diet, you know, and their uh, food insecurity is over 60% of the population. So, and oh, UPF is over 60% of our diet. It's just not a recipe for success. I mean, I think to add to, add to that. So I think in part of the, the issue here is that like, Basically, as far as I see it, like anybody in the U.S. who's exposed to our food environment on the regular is not going to be able to avoid these foods. Like, you know, unless you live a very privileged kind of, you know, lifestyle where you can purchase and focus on and spend the time or get somebody to do it for you. Like, we're not able to, you know, avoid these foods. But then if you, you know, talk about the existing inequities that we have in the U.S. where people from... Uh, minoritized racial and ethnic communities, um, people with um, uh, low income, um, you know, people with with um, the lo least access to high quality foods are, you know, even more susceptible to being, you know, to to having to purchase ultra processed foods like out of pure necessity. Um, you know, that's a, it's an, an a, it's an inequity that actually asks even more of people in these communities where there is food insecurity and there's limited access to high quality foods. It asks even more of them than it asks of, you know, the general population, which is just is so unfair. Yeah. And here's a when I worked at the Department of Agriculture, here's a shocking statistic. We, we uh, did a study uh, I, I was surprised by. We looked at what people are purchasing, particularly with a SNAP or food stamp program, uh, by far the government's largest program, most important program. It's the one that assures that uh, people have enough to eat. But it's different. You know, the other USDA 
uh, key programs, uh, uh, WIC, Women, Infant, Children, that helps uh, new moms with uh, food, something that half the infants in the United States are on, uh, school meal programs that help all kids in uh, America. Th those have nutrition standards to make sure that the food kids get uh, will, will not make them sick. But the food industry has fought hard to make sure that by far the biggest program, which is you know many times the size of those other programs, does not have standards. So we did a study. What was the number one purchased food for the that population, it was soft drinks, soda. And when you do the math, it was something like, you know, it came up to close to $10 billion a year taxpayers are paying to provide soda. Now, it's not that low income people have a desire to soda. It's just the cheapest beverage. It actually costs less than water. And you can say, well, why can't they just get water out of the tap? Because their pipes have lead and makes their kids sick. And so all we give them then to drink is soda is the cheapest choice. And that shouldn't be the case. And the government should leverage its SNAP program. It's something that um, I tried to do when I was there. Um, and I think that the current Secretary of Agriculture would like to do more on, but he's kept from doing it by the Congress, who's um, paid for by these big food companies that say, don't you dare affect our uh, soda revenue. It's amazing. I remember when the, the New York mayor, was it Bloomberg? Yeah. Tried to cut down on the consumption of soda in New York and what a lambasting he took. Do you remember he tried to stop people having those great big con containers of soda in the interest of public health? And uh, that didn't last long at all. So why have they got such a stranglehold on it? I, I, I mean, they should be answerable. They're meant to be protecting the health of the American people. You know, I, I asked Jerry this a while back because I was impressed when the flavored jewels, the vape pens, were really hit hard by legislation. And, you know, I, I think I think they're they really did a great job of coming down against it. They, you know, they saw kids really buying all those flavors and then they did something about it. But food should be the same. It should be identical. And so, you know, Jerry, maybe you can elaborate, you know, a little bit on why tobacco is in such, such a stronger place than food. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's a, 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 a tar refers to it as well. It, it is a great model that we should look to more for uh, a path forward to solve this problem. Because when I was at the Food and Drug Administration and we began working on this, people felt the tobacco industry was too powerful to ever regulate. They had succeeded in keeping from uh, being uh, regulated. And, and nevertheless, it was clear that that was the most uh, leading preventable cause of death. The country was paying an unbelievable uh, toll because of it. And, and so we set out to do that and succeeded. And ultimately, Congress did pass a law. First, we tried to regulate under our existing authority. It, 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 if the court said we couldn't, uh, then Congress knew that the job was up to them. They passed the law. And we were able, as I said, to bring down particularly youth smoking from 25, 35% down to less than two. And that's going to be extraordinary if, if, as, as generation ages now and we, we Get, you know, all, all those kids who once had would get cancer and heart disease won't. And, and um, you will see those numbers drop because of it. But unfortunately, it's being replaced by the food that companies are selling instead. And, and I think, again, it's unfortunate, but, you know, it's just how politically powerful they are. And more so than in the age of tobacco, the courts have changed the way that our elections are able to be uh, funded. Um, so tobacco industry, frankly, didn't have the they had the money, but they weren't able to translate into the political power. Power, um, that uh, food companies are able today because essentially all of our elected officials from um, the day they get elected have, start raising money for their next election. And that's overall, you know, who wins is who's uh, best uh, funded and um, not in every case, but in most cases. And so it just provides them an unbelievable amount of power um, to affect uh, policy. And we're seeing the result. And I, I think if I could add something to that, like the the premise that, you know, this is like a kind of a nice kind of model path, how tobacco le legislation was, um, you know, finally enacted, um, you know, there are lots of parallels with the industry, but I think, um, you know, what is kind of also lagged behind is like, because like the public sentiment, and you mentioned, um, Mary, the, the soda tax, right? And people got like, were so up in arms about it. I think, 
you know, some of that plays well, the individualism in the U S it plays well, but I think also there, there is kind of, you know, this reticence or just kind of general, like, well, you know, that's the food environment. That's what happens with industrialization. What are you going to do? You know, but I think that it's important to, uh, you know, like, and, you know, some of my work, I found that there are actual, like there do appear to be direct connections between U.S. tobacco companies and the spread of these hyper palatable foods into our food supply. And so I think that that um, could be a real, you know, it's a game changer in the sense that that should shift how we conceptualize these foods. And like, is that, you know, are these foods that were largely, um, you know, kind of disseminated into our food supply in the 80s um, from tobacco owned food companies? Um should we conceptualize those similarly as like a fresh whole apple that comes off the tree? Or should we really start to think more about these as like food substances and legislate accordingly? And if so, there's already a path on that. It's a very good point. In fact, we've got some uh, papers that you've written about that um, in the chat, if people want to uh, follow up on that. So here, here's my, a big question for me as an outsider. Um, you know, I remember seeing Michael Moore's film uh, where he went to the French school and had lunch with the kids in the dining room and couldn't convert any of them to drinking Coke. They were just so used to drinking water with their lunch. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. And there was a real cook making food, real food. That was the normal lunch. So first of all, there's other parts of the world with templates not controlled by big food that do it better and it works. So I think we should look outside of this model as being the panacea. And then the other thing is this FDA thing should be split up. I don't know how possible it would be so that drugs and food are not in the same house. What an unhealthy cohabitation that is. I mean, now we've got the ozemic drugs, ozempic, and all these other obesity drugs. So we've created the problem. Hey, now we've got something you can take. This is this is the, the perfect storm. So we're never going to address the issue because now you can make a ton of money treating the problem, uh, never actually directly sorting it out and solving it. And it's a win-win. Of course, the food industry is probably a little bit concerned because the craveability factor apparently goes down when you eat the uh, when you have these drugs. Uh, I don't know if that's going to make any big dent. Um, so what, what's no, no, Mary, you've identified, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, 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 what's going on that that really should alarm everyone, because in the U.S., two of our biggest industries are the food industry and the uh, uh, medical um, industry um, uh, called the sick care industry. Um, and, and they're both multi trillion dollar industries. And we've ended up with a, a food industry that makes people sick and then a sick care industry who takes care of them. <laughs> and and that has to change. Um, and and you're right. We should be outraged by that. Um, that that just is, you know, how horrible a, a society do you end up with? One where we drop off the chart with all, compared to all of our peers, as you're mentioning other countries. You know, in terms of life expectancy, that should be you know that should be a wake up call for everyone. You know, the one most important measure you want from your nation is to make sure that uh, they can maintain a, a healthy life for people. And we're not doing that. And we're not doing it because we've allowed our food industry to become an industry that's primary output is it creates sick people. And then we've dealt with it by allowing our healthcare industry rather than become an industry that prevents disease to become an industry when they come out of that pipeline of getting sick from their food. We're here to treat you. And while, you know, absolutely right what was said earlier about GLP-1s and food industries being concerned about it. They've been so brazen, though, and so unafraid of FDA. Uh, uh, Larissa can talk about this. But when when Wall Street came to them, there was, a, 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 your listeners may not know, there was, a, there was a Walmart. So Walmart, people know, right, sells food, also sells drugs. And so they could look at their own data and see that, huh, the people who are selling these GLP-1 drugs to are buying less of certain foods. And they just do the math. They go, well, now, almost half the country's obese. So that would mean that 10 years from now, half the country is going to be on these drugs. And that means they'll all be buying less of these foods. Well, the food industry, rather than responding and saying, you know, that's right. And we're 
you know, we're working to change what we sell so there are fewer people need these drugs. Instead, they said, no, we've been designing food to be overeaten for years. We're already working to figure out how to get these people on these drugs to overeat, um, you know, and then they'll get sick and then they can come up with new drugs and then our profits go up and their profits go up. And that's that's the way it is. And I think it's time for the American people to demand that, whoa, whoa, whoa everything here is based on us being sick and, you know, we're not okay with that. We we want that to stop. And we want to be able to watch uh, our, our TV when not being bombarded with ads for drugs because we're so sick. We we need to change that. And if it, we can't get motivated for any other reason, we should because of how sick our kids are. That should be, you know, the final straw. We should not have kids with type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, and need these extreme treatments. I, I, yes to what Jerry says. And um, we need better education. The reason I do so well with my diabetes, I have type one that I've had since I was 12. And the reason I do so well is because I've done the research because I've spent the time. I remember my doctor when I was in the hospital at 12 years old saying, exercise and eat right. And that's what I've done since then. And the only way for us to get to a different place is to educate kids to adults. I mean, it starts, it has to start with kids, but I know too many adults that don't know how to eat or how to shop or what to be looking for. And the reason I wrote my book was because people were asking me what I thought about, you know, Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat and whether or not these foods, pea protein, and whether or not these foods were healthy. I stopped drinking a creamer recently because it has a like a, a gel and an emulsifier. And I there's some preliminary data that says it's bad for our gut lining. So I was like, okay. I can't drink that anymore. I have to drink something that's almonds and water, right? So it has to be education. It, on the one hand, to me, that's what consumers need more of. They need more education, starting with kids. And on the big food side, we need more guardrails and they need to be legislated uh, against doing what they're doing right now. I think also that we need to, like within the context of um, the environment and education, like from the addiction kind of science space where I, you know, operate quite a bit. We know that education alone doesn't typically change people's behavior, um, particularly when you're in a, you know, ultra processed, hyper palatable food saturated environment. Um, so I think that, you know, that that can certainly be useful in some context. But if we don't address kind of this bigger um, main driver of our health um, consequences that we're observing, um, you know, it, it circles back to the individual. So I think that it's really, you know, critical here for us, you know, we actually, we wouldn't, we might not necessarily need so, you know, much education, arguably, if our food supply was designed to promote health, and there were very, very few and hard to access ultra processed and hyper palatable foods. So I think it speaks to, you know, the degree to which our environment is really, really um, a strong influence here. Good points. Also, I know you said the Mexican food product that, that had the big warning that you didn't see. I still mm -hmm. think that that is a really, if you had a graphic on a Cheeto bag that said, you've eaten today's su supply, your total daily percentage of salt, fat, whatever, on the, and don't eat any more, I'm sure that would have an effect. Well, you know. I think the countries that are using it are seeing success. I just think that in the US, you're just going to see something different. I don't think you're going to see that kind of change in the US. Yeah, I think the challenge with Reese is right. You know, I, I, warning labels definitely work, and it's a path we could take. The, the problem is, is unlike these other countries where they're using it, um, ultra processed food makes up a much larger portion of our food supply mm. than theirs. Mm. So in their countries, when you went to them, uh, they were on some products, but there are plenty to choose from where they're not on them. The problem with the U.S. food supply now is if we implemented those warning labels, people would go into their stores and <laughs> almost everything there would have these warning labels on it. And in a way, I, you know, I, I don't, is that the society we want? It's a bit dystopian that consumers go in there. And we've even seen that in these countries that, you know, there's a certain level of consumer burnout soon if it doesn't sh shift where they just have to live with this. But we don't want our consumers to have to live where every time you buy, you know, we, we shouldn't let the companies off that easily. They shouldn't just be able to say, I'm going to put a warning label on my product and then I can keep selling this and I can 
and spend, you know, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars marketing it to you. Maybe I can even make them think that the warning label is cool. Um, I mean, that's sort of what happened in cigarettes. And it wasn't until we were able to reach kids through a different kind of ad campaign, one that showed how food, you know, tobacco executives were making fun of them. They were, you know, getting them hooked to make profits and they were laughing at the kids being so silly that or, or, or not able to recognize how they're taking advantage of them mm-hmm. to profit for that. And I think that's what more Americans need to see. And I think education is particularly important with, with kids. And the best way to do it is not that they need more knowledge. Uh, they should be, as you were saying, Mary, and, and this is done in countries like Italy, mm-hmm. elsewhere, where kids get um, a scratch cook prepared meals at their schools, where they learn to understand what food is, is, they love food, and, and Americans need to revisit our our relationship with uh, uh, food. I, I get why we want cheap food. You know, I, I completely understand that. But as a nation, we now rely on less than one percent of our population to grow all of our food. Uh, that that is great for us, but it sort of leaves us a bit detached uh, from farming and how our food is grown. And I think we don't provide enough respect for that 1% uh, and all the work they do to prepare food. But then we compound that by saying we want our food to be so cheap. So I'll give you one anecdote. America produces some of the best seafood in the world. In fact, it's coveted all over the world for things like some of the shrimp, lobster that's grown off our shores and that people want that. Um, But almost all of it's shipped overseas to countries that, you know, are willing to pay more for their food. And where does our shrimp come from? It comes from Southeast Asia, where uh, they won't eat the shrimp producing. They want the better shrimp we grow, but we want the shrimp that costs so little. Now, part of that, we don't have time to get into it, but part of it is that we have so many people in our country where this matters. Money matters. The amount they spend on food really is a big deal in their life. And so they need to spend less, not because they're just making a choice that they want to spend the rest on on vacations or something. They just don't have enough to live. And, And that's a big problem we have to address. But well, for another show... Uh, has anyone got a last uh, note to end on? Hopefully an optimistic note, but not necessarily. Larissa or... Oh. Well, I don't want to down, but but one uh, optimistic as, as as Tara was down before, you know, we did succeed in tobacco. And so um, we had a situation similar today, 20, 25% of kids, depending on the population group, are obese. Um, that was a number comparable to who used to smoke. And now it's down to less than 2%. So I, I, I think people could be optimistic is that the other thing is the U.S. Department of Agriculture feeds one in four Americans each year. If it fully used its leverage, particularly in the SNAP program, uh, to make sure people made health healthier food choices and the school meal program to make sure that a a product like Lunchables never finds their way into a school (laughs) meal. Um, We have the tools to do this and we've done it before. It's just a matter of political will. And public support. (laughs) Public support. (laughs) And that that helps generate political will. Yes, Tara's right. uh, the rise in with COVID online shopping for food really, really picked up. And then we're seeing some in really interesting studies that show that online shopping can be um, modified so that people buy healthier carts. And so there's some interesting uh, research into that, uh, that Instacart is doing with different schools around the country, medical schools around the country that I think is really interesting. Well, this was incredibly uh fascinating, uh, full of uh, interesting things for us all to think about. And please go to the chat box. All of the work of the people that took place, took part today ha- ha- uh, are um, given links in the chat. So if you want to read more about the different kinds of hyper palatable foods or junk foods or new foods that are coming down the pike from Larissa's re- research. And of course, Jerry's written uh, a lot of, of stuff about why our food is making us sick, particularly that Washington Post article. So thanks uh, for your time and your input. Um, I just want to say Cambridge Forum is made possible through generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, Mass Cultural Council and you. So don't forget to sign up, go to the website www.cambridgeforum.org and an NPR broadcast will be available of this shortly. The podcast will be posted to the website. And I thank you all for joining us today. Take care.